This morning we wrap up our summer series on God's great story and great people through whom God has been at work. And today we take a look at Ezekiel. And our theme is repentance leads to reconciliation. Story. Tom and Dave were really good friends and really great business partners. They were in real estate. And they became extremely wealthy in flipping houses. You know how to do that. Where you buy a house that's in foreclosure, run down, you fix them up, and you resell them for a little bit of a profit. As the economy began to sour, they started their business as a way to keep low-income neighborhoods from deteriorating. But soon, Tom became more focused on making bigger and bigger profits. One day, he walks into the office all excited because he found a house that if they can get it, he believes they could make $50,000 to $60,000 profit on this house. All he needs to do is to convince the appraiser to fudge the numbers a little bit and to get the inspector to ignore just, you know, some minor deficiencies. Tom doesn't notice the family that's being put out on the street. He's allowed his conscience to become callous. He can no longer tell the difference between right and wrong business as usual and legal larceny. Dave realizes that something just isn't right here. His parents face mounting hospital bills. Their finances are in peril. And they finally decide to sell their house. The painful part was the property that Tom was looking to get his hands on just happened to be Dave's parents' house. Dave has a choice. He knows he has to speak with Tom. He knows he has to confront Tom about this. He knows it won't be easy. Tom is his friend and business partner, but these are his parents. And they're losing their home. Dave goes to Tom, reminding him of their compassionate beginning. How they started this business to help the needy, not exploit them. Dave reminds Tom how they hope to improve the neighborhoods, not take advantage of them. How they hope to make an honest living. Not to use others as a mean of personal gain or wealth. And then the moment of speaking the truth in love, Dave confronts Tom with his greed and self-absorption and his lack of concern for others. If you were Tom, how would you respond? Speaking words of confrontation, words of guidance, words of course correction can become one of the most challenging things we ever do. Most of us don't enjoy it, no matter which side of the conflict we're on. It's risky, it's difficult, it's messy, and it's necessary. Whenever we tell someone they can't or shouldn't do something, it's usually interpreted as bad news. You can't do this or you shouldn't do that. It may feel like a wet blanket on our excitement. That's really bad news. But is it? When a person's safety or well-being or a relationship is in jeopardy, we confront because we love. Is it bad news to tell our children not to touch a hot stove? No, it isn't. They could get burned. They could get seriously burned. We don't hesitate to confront them. We don't say, well, it's none of my business. We don't say, you know, if he really loved me, he wouldn't be playing with that boiling pot of spaghetti sauce on the stove. 
We don't say, I guess you'll just have to learn the hard way. Now we intervene, we grab our kids, we yank them away from the hot stove, we say, don't do that! Or is that just me? We confront them for their behavior. Not because we're superior, but because we love them. Don't touch the hot stove! Live! Confrontation, guidance, course correction. When was the last time you had to do that with someone? Did you hesitate? Did you follow through? How did it go? Ever think you'd much rather eat shards of glass than confront someone with their behavior? I have. I haven't eaten the glass. I mean, I wish I didn't have to confront them. More often than not, we take the easy way, don't we? We avoid confronting others for their misbehavior. And of course we have our reasons. We've all used them. It's not that big of a deal. I don't need to do it. it it's not worth the effort. I don't like confrontation. I'll just give them some time. It'll take care of itself. They never listen to me anyway. I don't think it'll really make that much of a difference whether I say anything or not. Sound familiar? The prophet Ezekiel does not have that luxury. He doesn't have a choice. God calls him to give a message to the people of Israel. He's a spokesperson for God. He's a sentinel. It's not a job for the faint of heart, but it is a calling from God. The book of Ezekiel tells his story. And what a story it is. I hope you take a chance to read it sometime. Born in 623 B.C., Ezekiel's father works in the temple of Jerusalem. Ezekiel is destined to become a priest. It's a time of relative independence for Judah. But there's a constant threat from a superpower called Babylon. When Ezekiel is 26, Babylon invades Jerusalem and takes all the people into exile, including Ezekiel's family, off to Babylon. For 30 years, they live in exile. During that time, Ezekiel is given a vision from God to speak God's message of judgment and correction, hope and promise to a people who have become unfaithful to God's ways. His words of caution and correction and clarity seem like bad news. But they come from God. From God who loves His people. Doesn't want to see harm come to His people. Don't touch that hot stove and live. Ezekiel calls the people back to God because God loves them. And God is faithful. He warns the people not to go on their own way. Stop living, doing your own thing. Stop taking matters into your own hands. Stop suffering the consequences of your behavior. In today's reading, God holds Ezekiel responsible for sharing a message to the people of God. And what a message it is. He is to bring words of caution and correction and clarity into the people's lives because they find themselves in desperate and challenging times. Listen to what God says to Ezekiel. Chapter 33, beginning with verse 7. So you mortal, speaking to Ezekiel, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. 
Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked, to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity. But their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. This message, by the way, side note, is a life and death matter for both Ezekiel, God's leader, and the people. Verse 10, Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have said this, Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Notice how the people take responsibility for their own behavior. They realize their own sins. How can they live? But notice what God tells Ezekiel to tell the people. As sure as I am the living God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I want the wicked to change their ways and live. Turn your life around. Change your ways and live. Don't die. Question, how do these words speak to you here this morning? Notice the word sentinel in this reading. It's a word we don't use. Perhaps we should. A sentinel is someone who warns. Someone who speaks a word of caution and correction and clarity. Somebody who speaks the truth in love. Offering a direction for life and redemption. That's why in worship, that's why in worship we confess our brokenness caused by sin. We confess our inability to speak and act in ways that bring life. We confess that we live and we interact with each other in ways that create chaos and death. Or is that just me? I hope it's not just me. But when we become a sentinel for one another, for one another, when we weigh the cost of speaking the truth in love against the discomfort of conflict, we can live and interact in ways that's life-giving. Who's that sentinel in your life? Who's that person for you? Who speaks words of caution and correction and clarity for you? Who comes to you when you insist on going your own way, doing your own thing, taking matters into your own hands, and living the way that's harmful for you and others? Who says to you, don't touch that hot stove? You might want to thank them. You might want to just listen to them. You might want to see them as your Ezekiel. Sent by God to save you from your own destruction. In our reading from Matthew this morning, Matthew offers a three-step three process for confrontation, for guidance, and course correction. Listen to these words from Jesus, Matthew 18, beginning with verse 15. We've heard them before. Jesus says, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that 
every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. In other words, that you listen to one another. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such as one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Jesus offers us a three-step process. Now, just go with me here for a minute. If a member sins against you, go to that person privately and just have a conversation about it. If that doesn't work, take two or three with you to make sure that the two of you can listen to one another. If that doesn't work, then take it to the whole church. At the time, the church wasn't even this big. The church was more like 30 or 40 in a group. If that doesn't work, then treat them as the object of your mission and ministry, sinners and tax collectors. Wow. This is not how most communities function. This is not how most people operate. This is counter-cultural. Sadly, when someone sins against us, we usually run and tell two or three other people. <laughs> we tell anyone except the person who offended us. You're not going to believe what so-and-so did or said to me. I'm going to tell you this. I'm never speaking to them again. Does that sound familiar? When we do that, we create a very unhealthy situation. What was a simple one-on-one -on -one conflict, probably a simple misunderstanding, becomes a huge unresolved conflict within the community of faith. And then more and more people just fester about it. We infect the whole community with a simple misunderstanding. Anger is like an infection. Communities that function like this constantly throb with unresolved conflict. I've discovered it's next to impossible to have a vibrant, life-giving community if we don't handle our disagreements in a healthy way. Jesus offers us a healthy way. The solution, go to that person privately. And when we do nine times out of ten, we can resolve the conflict. And the community isn't dragged into that drama. Notice who's responsible here. Notice who's to initiate this process. The one, the one who says they've been hurt. It's the one who says, so-and-so did this to me. If a member of the church sins against you, if that person who is hurt, the person who has been wronged has the responsibility to do something about it. Not the other way around. This because sometimes, so often, the offender doesn't even know he or she did anything wrong. Misunderstandings can morph into resentments. Resentments can turn 
into anger, and anger can turn into hatred, and hatred just hardens our hearts. There's a better way. Say that with me. There's a better way. Say it again. There's a better way. One more time. There's a better way. Dave goes to Tom, his friend and business partner, reminding them of their compassionate beginning. How they started this business to help the needy, not to harm them. Dave reminds Tom about how they hope to improve the neighborhood, not exploit it. How they hope to make an honest living, not by using others as a means for their personal gain or wealth. Then the moment of speaking the truth in love. Dave confronts Tom with his greed and self-absorption and his lack of concern for others. And Tom is struck to the heart. He doesn't fight. He doesn't get defensive. He listens. Because he knows Dave is right. Tom knows he has compromised his values. And he strayed away from the good that he wants to do. He is deeply grateful that Dave was willing to speak up and tell the truth in love. To correct him for his behavior and clarify his behavior for the future. Relationships are saved. Lives are restored. And a taste of the kingdom of God has come near. Who is your Ezekiel? Better yet, for whom is God calling you to be an Ezekiel for? Who's that one person in life you need to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with? All of us here can probably think of at least one person. So what are you waiting for? In a few minutes, I'm going to be standing right here offering you God's grace and love and mercy and forgiveness in a little piece of bread and a simple sip of the fruit of the vine. It's a gift from Christ Jesus himself because he loves you and he's calling you to speak the truth with words of love. Why? Because we are forgiven sinners. Amen.